Hey everyone, before you begin watching this recording, just wanted to let you know that we've had to do some editing to edit out some of the audio problems we had with one of the speaker's microphones. Uh, we've done our best to get uh, all that dead time out, uh, as well as to put the webinar in the order in which it was intended to be seen. Uh, if you see any or hear any references uh, to that, that's what it's referring to. And so without any further ado, I give you our webinar. Hey everyone. My name is Alan Dick, and on behalf of my fellow Commerce Next co-founders, Scott Silverman and Veronica Sonsev, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today is Wednesday, January 12th, 2022, and our topic this week is Reimagining E-Commerce, Solving the Considered Purchase Sales Problem. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome all of our speakers. First off, we have Ken Venya. He's the President Research Advisory over at Coresight Research. We have Emily Manroy. Digital E-Commerce and CRM Director at Clarence UK Limited. Joan Abrams, the Director of E-Commerce and D2C from Doral Home is with us. And finally, Denise Chung. She's the SVP of Product and Client Services at V24. All of them will be joining us throughout the webinar today and I wanna thank them for being with us. Also wanna thank V24 for sponsoring today. They're making it possible, much appreciated. Our gifting partner as always is Gift Now. Uh, gift Now from Loop Commerce, a solution providing the sales of your profits and gift cards in your e-commerce site. And it's one of the sponsors of this promotion. Uh, what I never tell our, our speakers is that they too get to have a chance of getting a gift from Gift Now, as well as five of our lucky live attendees will receive a, a gift. Sorry, replay listeners. Uh, you got to be here live to get it. Today's agenda, it's a monster. We're going to go right through it. Uh, in fact, you know what? I'm not even going to read it. That's how much there is. We're just going to go right into it. First off, Wake the kids, call the neighbors, save the date. Commerce Next 2022, season the next wave of growth is now open for applications. We're going to be holding it live June 21st and 22nd at the New York Hilton Midtown. You can apply to attend at commercenext.com forward slash CN 2022. We also have our next reception uh, at Shop Talk coming up in March. Uh, this is for retail and DTC brand uh, executives only. If you are one of those folks or know someone who is, go ahead and write me at Alan, two L's, two A's, Alan at commercenext.com, and I'll get you some information on that. Content. Oh, we got content. Our next webinar is going to be on Wednesday, January 26th. It's going to be New Year, New Email Marketing Strategies, sponsored by Coherent Path. And at, uh, Veronica Sonsep and my co-founders will be helming that one. That one will be quite good. More content. Oh, Alan, it can't be possible. Oh, but alas, it is. Yes, the podcast series continues. Uh, this time we've got Bob Sherwin. He's a CMO over at Wayfair, and he's going to talk about their approach to data-driven marketing. Uh, that's presented by Bloomreach, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or CommerceNext.com podcast. If you missed any of our past events, we have a library of over 200 videos over at our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash commerce next. Think of that as your online video library and resource center. If there's a topic you've got uh, some questions on, I'm certain we've covered it. Head on over there and you'll get some answers and some great videos. Housekeeping time. For those of you new to our webinars, don't worry about missing anything. We're recording the webinar and we typically make it available later today, certainly tomorrow at the latest. Let's take a minute to take a look at where things are on your screens. If you look in the upper or right-hand corner of your screen, you're going to see four buttons, chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. Chat, well, hey, pretty obvious. If you got something to say, say it here. You use the chat tab to comment on the webinar, share ideas that you've got, say hi to the other folks, uh, basically just kind of chit-chat. Q&A, though, that's a little more specific. We love when the audience asks questions. Please, that's why we're here. If you guys have a question, please ask it. And we ask it in the Q&A field. We ask you to do it there because other attendees can upvote it. And that gives us a clue as to which ones are the most important. So please let us know which is most important. Let us know your questions. And you can do that by entering uh, your questions or comments in the text field at the lower right. Finally, handouts. We got handouts today. We have both of our presentations. We have some materials from V24 as well. Please please feel free to go and download those at your leisure. And if you're watching this on a replay, the replay, but the document button at the bottom is where you'll find all the, the documents for you to download. And with that, I wanna bring up Ken Venio. 
He's the president of research and advisory over at CoreSight Research. My name is Ken Fenyo. I run research and advisory for CoreSight Research. We're a research and advisory firm focusing on the intersection of retail and technology. And let me just jump ahead. Um, I think we've already heard a bit uh, from Denise in the poll questions that considered purchasing or the complex purchase, there's a number of ways that people will call it, is large and, and growing, um, particularly when you think about online. So this is data on e-commerce sales from 2020. But when you look at categories where there's really a lot more consideration put into the purchase, uh, so consumer electronics, apparel, furniture, auto, all these things where people really want a bit more. You know, you think about buying a computer and you want more information on uh, speeds and, and the difference between Model A and Model B. Fashion's a little different. It, maybe the dollar amount is less, but you still have a lot of the uh, desire to say, like, is this going to be the right fit for me? Uh, but those are all big markets. You know, consumer electronics is $195 billion in e-commerce sales. Apparel is $184 billion. These are just giant markets uh, where the idea of getting more insight and more advice in the purchase process is widespread. And I think the challenge you see is it used to be you'd go in the store, you'd test it out, um, you'd uh, talk to the associate perhaps. Um, and that's still important, but with online, uh, it's really a lot harder. Online's great for transactions. Uh, if you think about going to an Amazon, uh, it's a great place to go buy everything you need. It's not as great a place to get advice and maybe more customized support uh, to really help you figure out which product is best for me. And so that's really the opportunity we think from online tools and, and some of the evolution we're seeing uh, to be able to do more. So we look at some uh, data we have, really what we understand is that the best solutions for online blend digital and human. And it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other, but it can be one augmenting the other that really brings the greatest value. And so, for example, um, when uh, we look at some data we ran on the computer market, uh, trying to ask people what information is most helpful when you're buying a brand for your laptop. What we found was that uh, customers use both digital uh, and self-service, but they also wanted that either in-person experience to test or the advice and more human contact to get um, information. And so if you look, people want online customer views, they want to view product information, they want to look at expert reviews, uh, but they want to go to the store, they want to get advice from friends and relatives, they want to get advice from a store associate or other data from the store. And so what well, we find it's really a mix. So when you think about more complex um, purchases where people are likely to want more information, they're debating which one is right for them, uh, it's important for retailers and brands to consider or provide both great digital experiences and also the ability to interact with a human or to touch and feel the product. And so those both together, it's not really an either or, uh, but really it's more of an and. And we'll talk about some of those in a few minutes. So if we look at the technology, and this is an area we really see a lot of evolution. And so traditionally there were things like we saw on the previous page, right? There's, you know, there's online content, there's FAQs. Sometimes you can call a call center to get more information. You could email uh, if you're thinking about online purchasing, but they were all fairly limited and static. And what we're seeing now is an evolution of technology that allows people uh, to have much more of an engaging experience as they work through, through these complex purchases. Uh, some of these are emerging. Uh, so if you think about virtual selling, live stream shopping, uh, independent expert advice, and AI, more AI-driven advice, all of those we're beginning to see a lot more use of in the market. And then there's some that we think are a little further out, but are worth considering. And so that's really when you think about the metaverse. And I'll talk about that for just a few minutes. Uh, but let me walk through these and sort of spend a few minutes on each of these explaining what are some of the trends we're really seeing and how are retailers and brands using these to help consumers work their way through these considered purchases. So let's talk about virtual selling. So virtual selling is this idea that I can connect directly with a store associate or a stylist or someone who has more expertise in the products that I'm selling directly. A lot of times what we're seeing now is through, um, is through video. You imagine today you might use FaceTime or you use Zoom at work, but it's a similar technology that allows a shopper to connect with um, a store associate or an expert to get more advice. And it can be very personal rather than just having it be a, a, a static page with some information. 
I can have a real conversation with a stylist to say, here's what I'm looking for. I'm going to a party. I'm looking for this kind of outfit. What do you think would be the best fit for me? Um, and so I, I think that, uh, well, we have a couple of examples here. So one of them is from Nordstrom, uh, which is offers a virtual styling service where you can sign up. You can you could schedule a session or do it live uh, 30 minutes, let's say, where you're going to get connected with the stylist who's gonna learn about what's important for you and make some recommendations. Uh, we also see this in China, which is, for many of you may know, is a great place to see the innovation that's going to happen um, in the States. Uh, they're a little bit ahead when you think of social and some of these, these digital engagement tools. But Fred, which is an, a global retail, uh, jeweler, uh, uses WeChat to do something similar. The ability to connect directly and live with an expert, a sore associate, a stylist to get more advice and guidance on your purchases. And so we think these are great. Incidentally, one of the things we're seeing is not just one to one, which which is really the way this has been primarily rolled out, but even that sort of a one to a few. And so if you think about having a mini party where it might be yourself and some friends connect to a stylist uh, at Nordstrom, let's say, where they can where you can as a group talk through a purchase process and, you know, you can uh, get it. You get advice from your friends, and and the whole group can experience it. So it it's a chance to really recreate some of what's best of the store, uh, but do it online. If I move on to live stream shopping, this is a newer uh, technology or, or way of marketing. It's big and huge in China. Uh, it's a three hundred billion plus market in China uh, for live stream shopping. And really, what live streaming is really more of a one to many technology where I can have a live. TV show, if you think about maybe QFC, QVC, excuse me, or Home Shopping Network in the TV world, let's transition that to digital where I can have, let's say, a founder or a product expert or an influencer come on and do a program where they're going to really get into the product, talk about the benefits of it, uh, share a founder story, uh, talk about the uh, benefits of the product. But one of the great things about live streaming, in addition to reaching a big audience, is the ability through the chat to have, really have a conversation with the host. And so what we find is that uh, you can ask questions in the chat, hey, that looks great on you, what other colors does it come in? Or what size are you trying on? Because that looks like a great fit on you, I wanna figure out if it's the right size for me. And so in addition to having a little deeper video content, it does allow you to have that engagement back and forth with the audience. And we find that really make transforms these shows from sort of a version of TV into a much more interactive experience where you can share advice and guidance. Um, and so Walmart's been very active in this in the US uh, um, across a bunch of platforms. And then in China, we see things like even now where it's more advanced, uh, you know, even having shows around cars, which you wouldn't expect to be something people would be looking to buy directly online, but it's a chance for you to see the new car, learn more about it, ask questions. Uh, and then whether you buy through the live stream or you follow up later, uh, it's a chance to really get more information about the purchase. If I go into exp independent expert advice, and this is starting where you start to see a blend of the digital and AI with the human, but the idea here is, can I have uh, services where I get connected with an expert, uh, maybe in a more independent basis to really find out what products are right for me, not just from an individual brand, but actually across brands. So Curated is a brand I, I followed for a long time now, they connect, if I'm gonna buy outdoor equipment, sports equipment, so I'm going skiing and I don't know what's right for me, they'll connect me with an expert who really knows their stuff about skiing. And so I can tell them things like, I'm a beginner and I'm going skiing in, in let's say California and it's gonna be powdery or it's gonna be icy. What do you think would be the best skis for me or the best jacket to get? And what they're gonna do is really learn a lot about you and make recommendations of what to buy. And you can go back and forth in terms of really finding the right products for you uh, and they'll they'll look at products across all sorts of brands. And Noom uh, is a similar idea, to a totally different space, but some of these same ideas, which is you want to lose weight. Uh, they have a lot of online tools, but then they'll also connect you with a human coach. And so that gives you a chance to have a real conversation digitally, whether that's through chat or video, where you can get real guidance on your nutrition needs. So it gives you a chance to have that much more customized and real personal relationship to get advice. And we think that's uh, that's really a trend we're seeing. These are examples of, of more independent, so they're not working for one brand or retailer in terms of the products they advise, uh, but this kind of capability, uh, we believe will start being incorporated in much more of a range of, of experiences, both at direct retailers and brands and across them. 
Um, in terms of uh, one other area we're seeing is maybe in addition to augmenting the human side is AI driven advice. Um, and so what we're seeing is AI really can start to mimic the human conversation uh, to uh, provide advice in addition to what you're getting from a, let's say a sales associate, but it could also be at a much broader range of times that are convenient for the shopper. So if you think about pastry is an example of one that gets really deep into wine. So they use AI to understand all sorts of uh, sort of the drivers of taste within wine. Why does one wine taste different? What are the things that make a one wine more preferable to somebody than another? And then it'll advise you based on what you tell them about yourself of what wines you should get. Um, another example of this is at Kroger, uh, they have something called ChefBot and it's somewhat gimmicky, but it's kind of a cool idea, which is if you take via Twitter, if you snap three pictures of ingredients you have, they will recommend a recipe that will use those ingredients. And so again, it's a sort of a way of getting down that advice uh, path, right? A areas of things I might want somebody to give me some personal help, but can I use AI that can fill the gaps and make it more self-service? We know that consumers from the survey I showed earlier do like self-service tools. And so that blending of the artificial, but also the human uh, and, and doing them separately, but also combining them, we think is a big opportunity. And let me just talk, spend a minute lastly, and I want to have believe, plenty of time for the panel, uh, but you know, the metaverse is an area that, that certainly we're seeing huge interest. I'm sure you've all been reading about it. it it feels you can't really do a presentation without at least discussing it. But I do think when you think of considered purchasing, the metaverse really is an interesting opportunity. It, it may take a few several years to develop, but if you think of this idea that not only can I have a conversation, maybe it's with my avatar, with somebody who's an expert on a product I wanna buy, let's say it's a computer or uh, the dress I'm looking at, um, and then even virtually uh, engage with that product. So maybe it's a dress and I'm gonna have my avatar try it on, and, you know, the better this technology gets, it can really start to show me exactly how it will fit and I can look at it in 3D. And so the ability to have a conversation, not just remotely with, a, let's say, an expert or an associate about the product, but even to sort of simulate what it will look like on me, or maybe it's a how will that look in my house, really adds a lot of uh, nuance that we can't get today. Now, the, the metaverse is in a very much in its early stage, so it's not like this will be tomorrow. Uh, but we are beginning to see companies, you know, I have an example from Forever 21, who's creating something on Roblox. We are seeing companies begin to experiment with it. And I think as this gets more refined, you'll see a lot of opportunities to engage around these considered purchases where retailers and brands can really enhance the experience in a way that people buying online uh, can get a lot of that experience and value uh, you can get in the store today. My name is Denise Chong. I am Senior Vice President of Product and Client Services at V24. We are a software company that specializes in person-to-person -person virtual selling solutions to brands. My team specifically, they're responsible for onboarding clients and partnering with them for long-term success. And we work with clients to create their unique brand experience online. At V24, we provide a family of technologies to help you bring the store experience to your customers in the comfort of their own home. And it's really a, a balance between automation and life assistance. And your end result is a memorable person-to-person -person experience that helps customers arrive at a buying decision. We serve clients who sell luxury, uh, health and beauty, like Clarence we have on the panel today, or uh, bigger ticket items like furniture. And these purchases require highly personal consultations that typically happen at a store. Uh, a great example would be a Cartier watch or an engagement ring, um, or a couch where customers need to pick out the fabric, or skincare where they want you to look at their complexion so it's, you know, it's two-way. So anyone can put video chat on the website but how do you give customers a seamless buying journey? And that is not um, easy to do well. So today I would like to share three lessons we learned together with our clients. Uh, number one, uh, for considered purchases, we find that customers really value education when they explore products online. You know, many companies do a great job now with payment processing online, but have a hard time making product discovery easy. 
So customers, re need, they need real-time help to narrow down their choices. Um, and they want personal advice or validation before they buy, right? And we've seen that an immersive experience with video chat and hand-holding give you the best results. And we're talking about like five times the conversion rate comp compared to self-service. And by hand-holding, I'm talking about things like co-browsing, co-form fill, or uh, basket assist. Number two, it is probably not a surprise uh, that video consultation gives you a higher client satisfaction, a customer satisfaction score compared to say phone calls, right, for one-on-one. -on -one. However, it, it was surprising to see how big the difference was. So we dug deeper. We learned from customer feedback that uh, video, whether it's one way or two way, is far better for creating that trust, that personal connection between your product expert and the customer. And your sales team can show that they're listening and really paying attention to each individual customer. And they could be engaging customers with their eyes, their facial expressions and body language, just like at the store. And they can answer specific customer questions and even zoom in on the products with a, a high definition or close-up camera. And they can show the sparkle of the diamond or the, the quality of the fabric. Uh, and just to know that this is one of the best ways you could replicate that in-store shopping experience online. Finally, uh, we found that uh, ad hoc customers, and I mean those who engage with you online just spontaneously, uh, they give us comparable average order value as customers who make appointments. Uh, we initially thought customers who make appointments must be better qualified leads because they, they go through the effort to provide their personal information and schedule this appointment with you online. We just automatically assume they must have stronger intent to buy and would always buy more. To our surprise, spontaneous customers gave us about the same and in some cases higher average order value. And because of this insight, our clients make sure they staff up for both appointment consultations and ad hoc consultations. So there you go. Uh, the three lessons we learned with our clients on how to get personalization right for considered uh, purchases online. Number one, making customer education an immersive experience in your one-on-one -on -one consultation will lead to higher conversion. Number two, you can simulate real life shopping experience with video and collaboration tools. Number three, spontaneous or ad hoc customers are as valuable as appointment customers. We all know you have to get personal at some stage in the customer buying journey. And we see brands who are successful make that strong human connection with customers before they make that purchase or before they come into the store. So that's what I'm looking forward to today, to hear more real life examples from our panelists uh, in the Q&A. So that's it for now. Over back to you, Alan. All right, thank you very much, Denise. And finally, it's now instant poll time. So let's do this. Question number one. Now, Kent was gonna go over um, the technologies that the considered purchase buyer uh, is needs in order to have a successful um, purchase on your site. And Kent was gonna break that into customer call centers, FAQs, user reviews, virtual selling, live stream shopping, AI driven advice, and actually other. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to open that uh, polling question and let's see what you guys are using to help the considered purchase buyer. Now considered purchase buyer is a person who has needs extra time, extra information, extra advice uh, in order to buy what's typically a more expensive or more um, complex product. Uh, it doesn't always have to be expensive, doesn't always have to be complex, but those are two characteristics. Right now I'm seeing to the bulk of you who are using user reviews, 31% of you are using those. FAQs are clocking in at 24%. Uh, let's see here, customer call center is at 19%. And virtual selling is also at 19%, very good. Live stream shopping, AI driven advice are at 3%. And there's nothing in the other category. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to close that poll. Let's go to question number two. For those retailers 
the physical stores. In the two years since the start of the pandemic, do your e-commerce and retail store teams work more, more closely together? Yes, we do work most closely together is the first answer. No, there's no change is the second answer. And no, we work less closely together. Huh. So it's actually coming in that about 72% are working more closely together, but surprisingly, 32%, there's no change. Uh, one can hopefully attribute that to you. We're already cooperating quite closely before this, uh, but uh, certainly this has not meant that anyone is working less closely together. Didn't quite expect it. Now, again, we always ask the questions in order to get uh, kind of a temperature take on our audience. We like our speakers to know kind of where everyone's at and helps uh, kind of helps them figure out how they want to me measure their commentary. All right, let's close that poll out. And now our last open poll. Question three, how would you describe customers' expectations for personalized experiences compared to two years ago? Now, this is going to be customers are much more demanding. Customers are somewhat more demanding. Not much has changed. D, customers are somewhat less demanding. And E, customers are much less demanding. Let's call it, it's customers are much more demanding is 51%. Customers are somewhat more demanding is 39%, 40%. Not much has changed is 6%. And customers are somewhat less demanding, 2%. But nobody says customers are much less demanding. I asked that question kind of as a kind of a benchmark because back in June, uh, we asked that very same question and we saw the same thing. Customers are much more demanding or somewhat more demanding. Uh, so pretty much the same response as the tempo seems to have stayed the same. Uh, the audience expectations are not dropping or your customers' expectations are not dropping. Um, yeah, interesting, very interesting. All right, we'll close that poll. And with that, I think what we're gonna do Rob, let's bring up the rest of the panel. All righty. So without further ado, Joan Abrams, how are you doing today? Hello. Thanks, Alan. Um, Why don't you introduce I, uh, yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your company? Yep, absolutely. So um, I am coming to you from cold Boston today. A uh, bit about my background. Uh, I spent 10 years in the jewelry industry working in e-commerce. We sold diamonds, gemstones, and uh, jewelry, uh, antique jewelry, um, items up to $50,000. So um, I know for most of the people that I know, that's a considered purchase for sure. Um, I'm now in the furniture industry working for Durrell Home. And uh, Durrell is a Canadian furniture manufacturer. Um, and I'm leading the e-commerce uh, direct-to-consumer initiative uh, under the brand name Real Rooms. That's R E A L rooms.com. Uh, we are growing. And uh, just a little plug I'm hiring. Uh, so please reach out if, uh, if anybody's looking. We're 100% permanently remote. So this is we'll, we'll get to recruiting at the end here. That's, that has become a standard commerce next practice <laughs> to let everyone pitch their recruitment uh, at the end. It's such a vibrant market right now. Emily, you are calling in from a great distance and you are staying up a little later than normal, I assume, on a work day. It's a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Emily Munnery. Uh, yes, calling from London, one of the many French in London. Well, despite Brexit, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> so I am the digital e-commerce CRM director, director for, for Clarence in the UK. Um, Clarence, for those who don't know us, uh, we are a French a family-owned beauty brand. Uh, we uh, we do uh, skincare, makeup, uh, mostly treatments. We are quite big in Europe because we're in the number one skincare beauty brand in in the UK and in most European markets. So my my job uh, here, and I've been in London for the last uh, four years in the company for the last 11 years. Uh, here, I'm actually growing the digital landscape. Um, I'm, I'm looking uh, at making sure that the service, content, experiences, and all digital touch points are best in class and the best we can offer. Excellent, excellent. And we just got a little love for you, Ken. Uh, May Johnson, one of our uh, attendees, said, loving all the real-life brand examples shared by Ken. So, May, thank you for the uh, comment. Ken, there you go, a little love for you. 
So let's get dive right into it. Um, I think one of the things that kind of surprised me was when we had the speaker prep call, I, uh, we started off with, just, I just assumed everyone knew what a considered purchase was. And then everyone in the panel was like, well, not as such. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's fantastic. And I thought, well, you know, maybe it's because I sold, you know, 425 pound cast iron claw foot tubs for 15 years. You know, of course, everyone considers <laughs> every purchase. Of course, everyone knows what it is. Ken, you had a pretty good definition of that. I'll let you uh, comment on that. And then uh, Emily, I'll come over to you. Yeah, well, I don't think, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't think there's a standard definition in the industry. It's not like a term of art, but I, I think it's really about more complex purchases where you know people are looking for advice uh, and guidance in terms of figuring out what's the best product or item for me. Um, and so I think that's really what, when you think about the consideration, it really gets at that. You know, it's hard to figure out, do I want this this dress or that dress or that that for, you know that couch or this couch and, and helping people make that decision is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Emily, you've discovered that uh, definitely with uh, yeah, beauty products. Thanks product. to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, a concept I, I ignore totally. To me, every I think every purchase for us in the in the beauty business is considered because you're actually researching. You want to know if it's right for your concern, for your need, for me right now. So you do spend time thinking about it. So in in that sense, I I think I think that makes sense. You you actually yeah spend time considering. And how does that work with your product line? I mean, people are definitely, I mean, how does, how, how does your consumer think about your products? I mean, typically, again, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a, you know, $1,200 cast iron claw foot tub. You're, you know, you're, you're not selling that, but it's just as considered a purchase, if not more. Because there's so much choice. I mean, all the ladies out there will, you know, agree with me. There's like tons of choice you can choose from. So what, why are you going to choose that one over that one over that one? What makes a difference? You're going to put it on your face. You know, are you sensible to more natural brands, more technical? You know, it's even though it's like a hundred dollars, you kind of you're really thinking because it's one. Um, amongst many products, a beauty routine for women right now, you know, you've got so many steps in it. So you do want to make sure that product A works with product B. You want to know where it fits within your routine. Is it, you know, are you going to put it before, are you going to put it after? It's, it's, it's more complex than you think. We women spend a lot of time thinking about it and researching before making that purchase. So, yeah. All right, Joan, let's talk furniture here. Clearly, people buy that just randomly, right? It's, that's an impulse purchase as far as you're concerned. That's how you market it, right? Not so much. No. Um, I think about a considered purchase in two ways. One certainly is price point. Um, you know, that was certainly the case in the in the jewelry space um, where I was. Uh, you know, if it's an expensive uh, diamond uh, necklace, you're going to spend some time thinking about that. So price point is a component. Um, but I also think about it in terms of commitment. Um, so furniture, um, we are selling ready to assemble furniture. So it comes flat, comes in a box. Um, so it's not super expensive. Uh, it's not going to be the most expensive uh, sofa that you're ever going to buy or expensive coffee table. Um, but, you know, you're only going to have one in your living room, right? You're going to have one sofa, one coffee table in your living room. You're going to live with that for for a while, um, so it's it's a commitment. You want to make sure that you like it, that it's comfortable, um, that it's some, something you can look at every day. Um, especially with COVID, we're now in our houses more than ever, so um, you want to make sure that what you're buying to enhance your living space is is something that you're gonna gonna love. So um, that's the commitment end of of things that I'm talking about. Yeah. So let's let's turn to now that we know what a considered purchase is and how it fits in with your companies. Let's talk about the how. Uh, and Joan, I'm going to start with you, then Emily, then Denise. So, Joan, how do you do this? How do you give the consumer the information they need uh, to, to 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 make these kind of more thought involved purchases? Yeah, um, for jewelry and furniture um the, the similar there's a lot of differences but the sim similarities are that people need a lot of information um, they read um, quite a bit of content that we publish on the site they're reading all the reviews they want to make sure how comfortable is this is this something that um, is comfortable to sit on is it comfortable to for someone to sleep on if i have guests how does it uh how easy is it to assemble so they have all kinds of, of questions um, and then there's, again, more content. Um, uh, 
lots of photos, every angle. What does it look like from the back? If you're going to position it in your room such that you're walking into the room and you see it, you want to know what the back of the furniture looks like. Um, 360 uh, photos, videos, any kind of content that can really help the customer understand how that piece of furniture is going to work uh, in her um, life, in her room. Um, that's certainly helpful. Emily, you have the same the same challenge. I mean, and I I, I would think even much more complex than that. Um, well, given I, that I this is something you apply to your to your skin, to your, skin, to your yeah. person. I, I agree with everything Joan said. Um, definitely, for beauty products, I think what people look after they want to know what it does, what are the benefits. They want to see all the stats on the efficiency. So they want to know exactly what it does to your skin, how many wrinkles are going to be reduced. They want to know all the data about um, efficiency. They want to know everything about the ingredients. Now you have to have the inky list. You know that when you turn back the products and you have all these little names and things, like if you don't have that, you know, anyone wants to look at whatever they're, they're looking after. They want to have the how-to videos. How do I apply the product? They want to know where it fits it in, in the routine. As I said, you know, is it product one, two, three, or five? Um, it, it's just, I think it's endless. They want, yeah, you know, the videos, the 360, I'm still questioning. I've got people requesting this, that what's the point, you know, you're seeing the box, you know, if I tell you what's written on it, do you really need to see that 360 for a product? Maybe not, but they want to see the quantity that you're supposed to be applying, you know? Am I putting a big, what, what type of, of um, a coin am I, am I putting on my skin? So all of this, but when you think of it, even though you, you, you think you, you've, you've thought of everything, it's never enough because it, it, there's always something missing for the consumer. They always have something else that they want to consider. So for us, that, that virtual selling thing was our answer. We were like, okay, how can we be more precise? How do we do it in store? Can I go into that, or do you want me to? Uh, should I? Should I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get into that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think for us it was okay. We, we're we're giving so much, but still it's not doing the deal. So we thought, okay, what do we do in store that actually works and that we don't do online? And in store we have our beauty associates, and they made the success of Clarence, especially in the UK. They're super knowledgeable, super friendly, not too salesy, like really nice. And what they do is actually they listen to the consumer. They don't talk, you know. They listen, they ask a few questions, tell me about this, about that, about your life, how do you do, da, da, da. and then they come up with a beauty prescription because they've heard everything you've told them. And they're like, okay, this is what is right for you. Not for your neighbor, not for your sister, just for you. And we thought if we manage to actually get that onto our website, then, you know, we've circled the whole thing. Like there's nothing missing. And it kind of brings, so we, we've, we've done it um, and successfully, but I think what it does bring back is that we think that with the web, people you know they were excited to be able to find the information themselves but we're not putting everything when you think of it it's up to the consumer to find whatever they need or as in the past you were going to the shop and you know everything was served to you so it was we went from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum and i think we need to meet in between and i think you can search as much as you want but comes a point where actually i'd like a bit of feedback there so mm. That's my yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Denise, any parting thoughts on this before we move on? We're getting some questions from the audience. Uh, Brian and may have asked a couple of good questions and Ken, we're going to get you back in here in just a moment. But Denise, any parting thoughts on this? Yeah, I was, I would really, I resonated. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, what you said, it's just the customer feedback is overwhelming when they say, like, I see both, you know, in the cases of furniture and skincare, I, I couldn't come in the store and you're able to give that information to me online. Like you came out with a double serum for eye and, and like, what's the difference between that and the original uh, or for, for face? Like you have to get those questions answered by somebody real, right? A, a real person. And I think connecting that with someone online before that, or they don't have to come in the store is, is priceless. 
Okay, I'm going to move on to the challenges in selling the considered purchase buyer, but I want to bring uh, Ken back in here for just a second. So I'm going to insert the question from Brian Atkins, and thank you, Brian, for that. Uh, Brian asks, Ken gave some great examples of live streaming and metaverse. How close are the panelists in implementing anything like this? Do you think your customers are ready for it? So Ken, that's, that's I mean, live streaming is definitely popular uh, in, in Asia. We're starting to see some of it here in the U.S. What do you think is the holdup here? Why, why do you think it's not getting as integrated as much? Yeah, I think it's, I, we are seeing it grow pretty quickly. Uh, a lot of people are testing it out. I, I just think that it's a, it's just a new format. Um, it, you know, in China, it's very promotional uh, is one thing. And it's also very dependent on the social, uh, social media. And I think in the States we've seen is a little more reluctance to jump into something heavily promotional. And also the social media sites like Facebook, Instagram are just beginning to add the functionality. So it's been a been a bit of a chicken egg thing. I think we are seeing people adopt it. One big difference versus China too, it's people are doing a lot more on their own sites. So you'll see retailers and brands uh, across really all the product categories doing these from their own uh, websites and apps, um, uh, as well as trying to simulcast on social media. But it's, it's a little bit more of a CRM uh, tactic for it we've seen in a lot of cases. Um, uh, so we do think it's growing. We think it's going to grow a lot more this year. We're pretty excited about where I think that'll grow. I think to answer the other question, the metaverse is probably a little more future thinking. Uh, so <laughs> I'm think? sure we'll see some experiments. Um, now, look, if if you want to sell digital versions of your clothing, uh, I think that's that might be real. We do see like on the AR, VR furniture is one of those areas. People have spent a lot of time figuring out like, how can I visualize this furniture in my room? Um, yeah. So I think you are seeing tidbits of it, but it, it's probably gonna take a number of years to develop. Um, if I may, uh, it's really part of the process. If, if I may jump, may jump, yeah, we've we've tried um, live streaming in the UK. We do a couple of sessions per week. Um, I mean, it's it's it 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 has some some interest. Uh, I what I see the di the difference I see is I think the Brits are too shy to ask question and interact in the way the Asian do. That, that's really the feeling. They're not as, you know, asking so many questions. You know, in a webinar in, in Great Britain, like in the UK, you know, has anyone got questions for the panelists? There's no questions, no one dares to ask anything. So I think that's the limit of the system for our cultures, maybe. Maybe you Americans are a bit more outspoken, but that's that would be my feedback for the moment. They're not ready yet, but it's mm -hmm. you know, doing it in a, in a nice way. And it's, uh, I think the more, if more brands, you know, offer that, it will, become the norm and, and people get used to it. But. Mm -hmm. Joan, I see you nodding over there. As an American, how do you react to this? Uh, yeah, I think um, Americans have no, no problem asking questions and, and participating. Um, so in terms of um, the furniture industry, so Ken talked about the different different technologies and where they are. I would say that um, our business, Real Rooms right now, we're, we're pretty much still in the traditional we are um, we're working um, hard to present the customer with all kinds of content, user generated content, reviews, videos, you know, all of those those things. Um, but we um, absolutely see um, the value in in those emerging technologies that that Ken referenced, like um, AI um, chatbots or AI. Uh, driven advice. I think that can absolutely help our business. So that is something that we're looking at. And then virtual selling. Um, you know, again, with the furniture, you're, you're really looking at how is that going to fit in my space? Um, how is it going to look? What kind of style? What kind of um, mood am I looking for in my um, living room? And um, you know, if you're like most people, you're not you're not an interior designer. You're not an expert on home decor. So um, if we can pair that expert virtually with the consumer to help make that decision, um, then I think uh, it will have some big wins in that area. Yeah. And I don't have a question for, for, for Joan, because uh, I know that when we probably talked about, you know, ideas around um, in-home design and um, can you really, do you see that translate with, with um, you know, being able to do it virtually? So you could actually advise a customer, well, look at your living room. Uh, maybe you could you know, give them advice on how to accessorize and then what fits. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I do see that in the future. Um, it's just getting the, you know, the human expertise, getting those, those designers, those, those decorators, the expert people, um, and connecting them with, with the consumer. Um, you know, you, we, we sell so many different types of, of furniture. So, so many different types of, um, sofas, right? Like which one should I go modern? Should I go, uh, you know, convertible? What, what kind of what style is going to work? What am I, what am I looking to achieve? How am I, how am I going to do that? Because, you know, even if we, we do, we offer, um, you know, you can return the product if you don't like it, but who does that? You know, you're, you're going to get a couch. It's a, it's a major, um, uh, purchase. You're putting it together. You're assembling it. It's a headache, right? Um, nobody's going to return it. You want to get it right. So they can remove that, the question, um, by having that expert advice, then, uh, I think that's, that's going to be a win in the future. Yeah. We, so we're getting a bunch of questions. I think we've talked about the challenges in selling the consider purchase by, I think, uh, Emily talked about that. I think I want to, um, I want to address a, a question from, uh, Alice Kimball, uh, with wages going up, how can retailers better leverage in-store employees for this type of experience? And I, I'll be honest. When the pandemic started, it, I mean, we were probably like a week or two into our webinar series when one of the panelists said, yeah, you know, with all of our stores closing, uh, you know, we found a way, you know, to kind of ad hoc get all of our store associates to become online brand ambassadors. And we're trying to marry them up with all the people in their area and do it virtually. And, you know, just what I really liked about it, aside from just the, the cleverness of it, was the compassion behind it in that you could you know, people could keep their jobs, you could keep them working, you could keep things moving. And I, when I saw that V24, you know, we were considering this, this topic and V24 came on, I really kind of dug that you guys were doing that. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw all that in there so everyone can kind of contribute with this. Uh, let's talk about better leveraging in-store employees. And, and Denise? Since this is up your alley and down your street, well, we I was might just, as well start I, with you. Just excited to see, um, you know, as soon as pandemic hit, everybody pivoted, right? I was like, hey, could you set set me up so that the associates can go into store? And and John, you've been in jewelry, right? Like, you, it's expensive to stock up, and you could yeah. still have your associates and maybe the. Uh, make one of the stores a dark store or if you have challenges in staffing and your uh, flagship store is super busy you could easily uh, route uh, a virtual engagement to a less busy store and so that for for virtual viewing because uh, then you have the stock right there at the store and you have um, the experts uh, not flagship but at the other store. That's a great way to leverage team members uh, across the, you know, less frequent stores. So that was a, a it was great to see our clients innovate <laughs> with, mm -hmm. with a pandemic coming along, right? That's when innovation is born. I love the dark store idea. Emily, can you talk about that for just a second? Yeah, that's, that's the route we took. Um, I think the, the, the dark store we, we recreated, so we, we, we went a bit further, we recreated the fake store within our head office in London, and this is where we brought our people who are serving the, what we call the virtual boutique. Um, I wish we could have done it from, you know, in store, all of our counters, but this is where the business model comes into play. And I've been thinking about it for a year now, but there's no way around it for us. So if you are a retailer who owns their store and their people, absolutely you're free to do it but in our case we're a brand that retails with partners department stores so basically these they are not really our stuff you know they could be shared stuff or they could be their stuff so they were there wearing the clarence uniform but we can't actually engage from clarence.com with these guys because these guys are paid by our retail partners and the sale that they do would come to the clarence.com PL. So again, it's a very difficult situation where you're leveraging, we're basically diverting the sales from our retail partner business to our own DTC business. And the you know, I've looked at it in every angle, it just doesn't work. So mm -hmm. the only option to for us for a brand like us is to work in partnership with our retail partners to then find the way to actually use our shared stuff to sell on their website. So basically it's on the e-sales side that they need to implement those solutions to be able to leverage the stuff in store. So we've, 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 we've done a few trials with some of our partners, uh, but again, that's a very, so we have two options and it's two services. 
So just putting out there, because if there are brands in, in the audience listening, you know, that's the kind of, if you don't have, it's not your store, it's a bit more complex than that. Oh, absolutely. Any other quick thoughts in the panel? We're getting, oh, it just, we just never have enough time. You know, it's, so uh, any other quick thoughts? And I'm going to try to get some of these other quick questions done uh, from the audience, because there's some good ones. Going once, going twice, we move on. Uh, from Michael. Excuse me, Emily Michael. Uh, how much do you see UX design playing to consider purchases? That's a toss-up. Anyone can take it. Anyone? Um, I'll take it. I'll take it. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, it does play. We do, we do use a tool, uh, which is called Content Square, um, to optimize our conversion rate uh, and, and, and how we kind of manage that. Uh, and we keep optimizing. So yes, the UX is key. Sometimes the call to action is not at the right place. Sometimes the the content is not at the right moment in the journey. So we do look at it on a on a daily basis, and we keep optimizing our pages, especially when we launch new products. Right. Yeah, I would, I, I would agree with that. Go ahead, John. I'll yeah, it's it's extremely important. Um, we have visitors coming back to, um, I call it to visit their their furniture. So they come back to visit the furniture. 8, 10, 15 times before they make that purchase. So it's absolutely critical to keep in front of them, um, to be able to you know, show them what they looked at last, make sure that they, they can save that item or favorite it or, or whatever, um, so that they can you know, come back and visit before they're ready to make that commitment. Yeah, and, and we see that our clients, um, when they introduce new tools on the website, like, you know, build your own uh, mattress, right? You can, you have all these options to pick. It's so helpful to have a bit of handholding or expert advice to so like, how do I use this? And once they, the customer gets going, um, they know how to do it. They, you can, they can do it on their own. I think that's super helpful to have the handholding virtually. Mm -hmm. Brian uh, GS, how many of you are trying to build algorithms to personalize the e-com purchasing process and how are the customers reacting to that approach? Anyone here trying to build any algorithms going once? Um, you know, Again, I will say on that one, we time. are seeing, we are seeing a lot of companies try to add, you know, I've done a lot of personalization for a long time and uh, it is an area where you're seeing more AI added in. And I think part of the value there is the ability to go beyond the obvious. I gave the tastry example, but there, there's others I've seen. And if you think about it in food for a second, a lot of time it used to personalize based on, well, I bought uh, this pasta sauce, so I'm just going to give you recommend it that same pasta sauce again. But increasingly, you could understand, well, what is it about the flavor in that pasta sauce I'm buying? Or if I look across all the things I buy and start understanding, well, maybe I like, you know, spicier taste, or maybe I have a certain diet I'm on. And so then being able to recommend based on that, not only does it make it get you into new categories, uh, but it also helps like with new brand launches, right? So you think about how do I match up a person with a brand they've never tried? Well, if I have a much more refined sense of what kind of things I like, or am I the kind of person who likes new items or trying new things, I can be a lot more refined. And so I think that AI, we definitely see coming in to this personalization and loyalty space and, and can bring a lot that kind of next generation of uh, next level of relevance into the conversation. All right, we are at the top of the hour. I'm going to uh, remind all of our uh, audience members that uh, we have all kinds of uh, information, including both presentations for you to download. Uh, what I would like to do now is I'd like to wrap up with each speaker, uh, A, pitching the open slots at their companies and how awesome it is to work for you, and B, uh, any final quick parting thought, anything you think is key for the audience to know. So, Joan, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, R E A L realrooms.com. Um, we're hiring. We're specifically looking for uh, SEO experts, um, but uh, willing to talk to anybody with uh, great e com experience. Um, just looking forward to a great 2022. Outstanding. Emily, I, we do get some folks in from the UK. Maybe you can. Fill, fill you all of your open vacancies. Okay, two vacancies <laughs> at the moment. Uh, more on the junior side, but maybe you've got you know nephews, nieces, whoever wants to come. <laughs> okay, uh, we have the ecom merchandiser role uh, open, so merchandising the site, creating the promotions, uh, and we've got an SEO coordinator role, so organizing a big SEO project we have at the moment between agencies and in-house teams. So really exciting times for us um, with a growing team. So yeah. Please All right. feel free to take them to me. Denise, 
from the, the, the service provider side. Are yeah. you hiring? He asked, knowing the answer. <laughs> <laughs> We're always hiring, whether it's engineers, sales, or my team, client success. Um, you know, whoever's interested in you know looking after clients like you know like Clarence is is welcome. Uh, I also welcome you to go to the the handout section to download. Uh, certainly, my team is looking forward to creating that virtual selling experience for all of you. Outstanding. And Ken, I'm going to give you the final word here. Um, oh, I, I did want to mention that Corsair Research, a uh, very, very well-known, well-respected uh, research company. We're really happy to have uh, you on this webinar and partnering with us throughout the year. I just want to make certain that everyone has a chance to uh, have your contact information in case they have any questions or, or want to follow up with you. So, Ken, if you want to give that as well as uh, what you might be hiring for and any final thoughts you have. Yeah, absolutely. So we're... Um... We're, we're always hiring for analysts and, and people are really passionate about retail. If people, we do cover a lot of these topics and if we have a free newsletter, if you want to stay on top of some of our research, you can uh, access it and register at coresight.com, uh, C-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T.com. And, and you can get me at Ken Fenyo, K-E-N-F-E-N-Y-O at coresight.com uh, if you wanted to chat more about any of these topics. Look, I think this is a great area. I think there's a ton of innovation happening. What my recommendation for whether you're on the retail or brand side or even the tech side is I think it's a great time to be experimenting and trying new things, you know, whether you do it in a limited test or a broader rollout. It's a lot of this technology until you really test it out. It's hard to know how it can help your business. And so I think it's a bit of a golden age of retail technology. And, and I think there's a lot of partners you can find uh, V24 and others who can help you through that. Uh, but I do think it's a great time to be experimenting and and finding the technology that can really help your experience and, and build the relationship with your customers. All right. And with that, I want to thank V24 for sponsoring the webinar today. I want to thank all of our speakers, Ken, Joan, Denise, and Emily. Thank you so much for taking the time and doing all the work to make certain that this was a good presentation. Thanks as well to our audience for taking the time to join us today. We appreciate your continued support. Please take a moment at the end of this uh, webinar to answer the survey questions. We really love hearing the feedback. I'm Alan Dick, and on behalf of everyone here at Commerce Next, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here on January 26th. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.